Ladies and gentlemen, over the course of two months, I've been trying to review this. And over those two months, I've had four different gameplay videos ruined, and I've gotten sick twice. And despite how it might sound, I'm still going through it. I almost passed out for some odd reason today while walking around outside. I'm getting cold sweats and yada yada yada. However, this is what I've been trying to review. This is my custom Cerakoted RWA Battle Arms Development Short Barreled Rifle. Or as they're calling it, the RWA BAD SBR AEG. It's not too often that I get something made just for me, but when I said to RWA that I was bored of doing M4 reviews, they figured that they would do something a little special to this one. So here we are with a custom UV reactive Cerakoted BAD. And guys, I am loving this. It really doesn't show up as well on camera, but this is so cool. However, we have a review to get to. I've been running this same stubby M4 for a couple months now, in CQB arenas, at field skirmishes, and I've had a lot of people handle it and use it for themselves. I've even put this one in the hands of championship winning speed softers, and they loved it. It might not be as lightweight as some of the things that they're using, but I mean, just look at what they're using. Of course it's not going to be. But with all that said, let's go ahead and take a look at this RWA BAD SBR AEG and show you all the things I like about it. The pros and cons, the internal look, and just talk about the performance and see if this is really worth your dollar. All while trying to be as fair and unbiased as possible. Of course, a big thanks goes out to RWA for sending this good looking piece of art my way. And I want to thank Extreme Airsoft out of Rhode Island for letting me capture a lot of footage that you'll see here today at their amazing arena and store. It's definitely one of the greatest airsoft venues in the United States. And you can bet that I'll be adding a link for the RWA BAD series because Evic, of course, has them in stock. Both the 7.5 inch barreled SBR and 14.5 inch barreled standard rifle run for about $450. So let's go ahead and see if that $450 price tag is justifiable where we always begin with the unboxing. And that starts with a well-designed cardboard box from RWA, showing you exactly what's inside. Energy less than two joules is an understatement. You'll see what I mean by that later. Opening the box, everything is packaged nicely with the replica in a plastic bag and some cardboard holding the parts down. Packaged separately would be the CNC Fortis muzzle brake and this buffer tube extension that some players will for sure need. After that, I'll just take out the RWA BAD and get moving along. There's no manual in sight other than a card for the RWA Gate Aster Optical ECU, so let's just put away the box and again, move along. And no, I haven't forgotten about the Battle Arms Development 120 round midcap magazine. It worked for me mostly, but I noticed a few rounds would stay inside the magazine. An extended follower would have negated this. But then again, I'm not in charge of development, and that's a tragedy for the greater good of the airsoft community. This magazine also doesn't drop free from my BAD. I contribute this to an ever so slight layer of Cerakote that holds onto the magazine, but pretty much every other magazine I have feeds properly and drops freely, so feel free to experiment. First impressions of the BAD, however, are of course skewed for me. There is no way I can be 100% non-biased here, as this one was Cerakoted just for me. This UV reactive paint is awesome. I just really wish that I could show it off fully, but it doesn't come off on camera very well. It may look like a random splatter of paints, because it is, but when I hit it with this flashlight, people just start asking questions. Now, originally, I personally asked for the smaller SBR model as I prefer smaller M4s at the moment. When I need them for CQB purposes, they always do the job. I normally see hundreds of M4s and I've seen all the special features and every combination you can think of. So excuse me if I sound a bit rude at any point in this review. It's hard to impress me with an M4 nowadays. 
and it's only going to get more mundane for me as I continue making content over them. However, with this PDW style stock, I knew immediately that battery space was going to be a problem. Now, the nearly entire aluminum build keeps this Battle Arms development AEG down to a weight of 5 pounds 3.4 ounces, or 2,368 grams, without a magazine. Then for length, the SBR measures at 23 inches long when the stock is completely collapsed. But when the stock is at its furthest length, you'll have a 27 inch long platform. There's not much else to point out here, so let's go ahead and move on to the controls and features, starting at the front where I've put on the correct Fortis license muzzle brake with an Allen grub screw holding it in place. I am happy to see that this was included in the box, as I'd appreciate it if all manufacturers could include the correct muzzle devices in their boxes, especially for those countries like my own, where we mandate a blaze orange tip of at least a quarter inch. As for the muzzle brake itself, I think it looks really good on nearly every modern gun that I own, but I really wouldn't suggest grabbing onto it. These spikes can easily cut you if you're not careful. Feel free to swap it out if you don't like it. You have 14mm counterclockwise threads at the end of the barrel if you need them. As for the barrel and handguard themselves, we have another Fortis license setup with weight saving cuts throughout, and M-lock slots at 3, 6, and 9 o'clock. On top, we have the standard Picatinny rail that everyone is familiar with, and it flows to the upper receiver nicely, and on both the left and right side of the handguard, you'll see quick detached sling slots. Where this handguard really disappoints me is with the single M-lock slot underneath the SBR model. You'll get five slots on the 556LW model, but for the shorter variant, well, it's nearly useless, unless you only intend to attach a hand stop here. The reason for this would be for the quick swap lever. This would be a cool touch to those people who demand realistic parts and accuracy to the real thing, but honestly, you're never gonna really need this feature. It is a nice touch whenever you need to throw on some attachments. It does make it easier then, but it's just not a must have feature in my eyes. Another change done to my SBR is the black Cerakoted barrel. I would have preferred to have the silver accents seen on the stock BADs, but it's fine. There's nothing else really under here besides some flutes on the barrel that keep the weight lower, but that's it really. As you look around, you'll see all sorts of cuts that removed just a little bit of weight here and there. Even the trigger guard and brass deflector have been milled out. The aluminum magazine release may have been enlarged, but it too was lightened up. And I'm sure that this PDW stock setup cut down on some weight as well. But let me be a little negative. I hate this four position PDW stock. I really do. And so did everyone else that handled my BAD. If you want to know why, then let me try to open up the stock. it just doesn't do what you want it to do. It's stiff once you get it to the position that you want it to be in, but it releases so inconsistently when you hold down the button. I can't just swap it to another position when I want to. I have to get lucky. There's a special way of opening this stock, I'm told. But if I need a 14 step guide to open a stock that should just be push this button and pull, then there's a problem. I've tried pulling the stock as I push the release button, and I've smacked it as I push the button. I've even catched myself bunting it against tables and walls to close it. And that's really embarrassing when people start looking at you doing this. If I replace anything on this BAD replica, then it's going to be the stock. I do appreciate the rubber butt pad though. That does keep it planted to my shoulder or my gear when I want it to be, but it can be easily removed if you don't want it or whenever you want to get to the buffer tube that houses the Dean's battery connections. I am happy to see Dean's connections, especially on a $450 to $500 replica. But as you would expect, battery space is very limited. Even with a candy bar sized 11.1 LiPo or a 7.4 LiPo, I found myself just having to cram it down the buffer tube as much as I can and then covering up the rest with the rubber butt pad. It might look ugly, but this works. 
you'll either have to find some really small 7.4 buffer tube batteries or just put up with this. You really don't have any other option, unless you go ahead and screw on the buffer tube extension that you got in the box. This looks really stupid, but what are you gonna do? And yes, there is a buffer tube cap that comes with all BAD rifles to cover up the connections. But I lent this rifle out to a single friend and he lost the cap on his very first game. Other than this, we get another cutie sling slot to make use of. And the mock carbon fiber is a neat touch. But now we're left with the intricate and interestingly designed billet styled receiver. It's all about weight savings when it comes to the RWA BAD. From the magwell to the brass deflector that us airsofters need so badly. This setup kind of reminds me of a high grade competition rifle. I really like the enlarged buttons like the bolt release that does help with holding and releasing the mock bolt carrier when you're making hop up adjustments to the rotary. You will be getting an ambidextrous selector switch that does feel good and I'm not joking here, they decided to name this thing the badass safety. Okay, it's got a little bit of wobble but nothing worth docking it for. But that's all I have to say about that. I would have loved to see ambidextrous magazine and bolt releases to go along with it though. Besides all the cuts in the receiver and the barrel and the PDW stock and even the ambidextrous fire selector, this feels a bit rinse and repeat and that's not a good thing, but it's expected of most M4s. You'll find trademarks all throughout the receiver and the entire replica even down to the takedown pins, but other than that, the grip is rather nice. Its texturing is well placed, but not so aggressive that it hurts, and with the straight and hooked trigger, it's a comfortable combo. I haven't forgotten the plastic flip up sights though. I expect most people who own a Battle Arms Development SBR or 556LW to use some kind of sight when in CQB, or at least a tracer unit. But if you want to use these included sights, then they're both adjustable for windage, while only the front sight is adjustable for elevation but the rear sight does come with two sizes of peepholes, so that's good. So with Rammstein playing on my TV and the gearbox out after removing the stock, magazine release, selector switch, bolt catch, and the GMP M140 high torque motor with screw on connections, along with the pistol grip, we have the common version two gearbox. Don't expect a quick spring change window in the back of the gearbox though, as if it would matter, since it only took us about 20 minutes to get to the gearbox anyway, but we did like the port to trip the anti-reversal latch. That was cool. However, once the gearbox was opened, our suspicions of the origins of the gearbox were confirmed as GMP. To run down the parts, we get a linear mainspring with a steel spring guide. Everything looks to be standard version two from the compression parts to the steel gear set. But we really didn't like the compression set at all. The 14 tooth piston, with the front five being made from steel, came with three ports on top, an o-ring around the head, however the front face of the head was not sitting flush with the piston. The aluminum cylinder head came with a rotating rubber pad and a single o-ring, but we didn't have a tight fit with the non-ported cylinder and we were able to separate these parts with no effort at all. Furthermore, the cylinder itself has a strange pattern inside that seems to be polished and tapered, which may be acting as a port substitute. You can feel how the cylinder is tapered as well. Then for the nozzle, we have a little bit of play from side to side, but it did come with an o-ring. Then for the gears themselves, the shimming was not very good. Go figure, you'll want to do your own proper reshim. We only saw three shims in this gearbox, so that might be a bit of the problem. Then for our last step to check up on, the steel barrel hosts an O-ring near the front, and the hop up is all pretty standard, with a split nub that was really offset for whatever reason. So I do not expect the very best for long range performances right away. What I'm the most concerned about is the compression, and if you still don't understand why, then let me take the RWA BAD SBR to the chronograph. Right away, those power readings are low. I didn't expect to see sub-joule readings, but I'm guessing this was meant for the Asian market. Trying out the rate of fire with an 11.1 LiPo is where those compression issues really show themselves in full stride. 
that's a big drop in power. And then when I swap back to semi-auto, we actually went up in power before it started to settle back down. So consistency is not this replica's strong suit. Moving on the range, 100 feet wasn't a problem at all with 0.28 gram BBs. So for most CQB arenas, you should be just fine. At 200 feet, however, that's when I came to the conclusion that this is not a field gun. The power is just too low. I can make some hits land, but not over and over again. And my volunteer named King said that the BBs were hitting him with very little force. So if you have to pay extra attention to incoming fire to guarantee you're calling your hits, then that's my cue to say that this isn't meant for US field games. For my last test, I planted my BAD rifle to a table and I placed a box at 50 feet. And you can see some pretty nice groupings after shooting it a couple times. Again, this should be treated as a CQB tool. I don't know how much better at range the standard length model is, but as for my SBR, stick to CQB. Your power is just too low, so your range will suffer, but with the range that you have, you should be more than capable of nailing any target in most CQB arenas in the United States. But don't forget about the optical Aster ECU capabilities. Locking the gearbox to semi only or semi three round burst or even turning your full auto into a binary mode is very helpful. The electronics inside can do more than that too. So go ahead and look into all the offerings when you get the chance. But after all this, why do I still use this M4? Well, despite it being a custom Cerakoted model just for me, I just tend to like tiny M4s for certain games. Yeah, it looks really good in my opinion, but the trigger and electronics inside stomp out all my other stubby M4s at the moment. And whenever I can use binary, I definitely do. I do like the feel of this platform, but I wish it had fully ambidextrous controls. And I hate the stock with a passion, but that's about it. The lore of battle arms development is honestly a bit lost on me. Maybe there's someone watching right now screaming that I'm not showing BAD the respect that they deserve and that I should be praising them on how accurate this thing is to the real rifle, but trademarks don't make an airsoft replica good. If I could flash back to my Elite Force Glock review, I remember saying, It can say McDonald's along the side for all I care, as long as it works as it should and stands somewhere in the middle of the chart of performance in comparison to other gas blowback pistols. As someone who's been playing with this replica for a couple months now, and who's asked other people to give their opinions on it, I'd say it's a pretty good AEG. For $450 to $500, I can see myself picking one of these up. But again, I would either replace the stock or pick up even smaller batteries. However, to conclude this review, I'll bring in my rating system that is dependent on the replica's power source, meaning that AEGs are only compared to other AEG standards. So for performance, I'm going to have to dock it for not being suitable for most field games in the United States and for its compression issues. I'm for sure going to swap out some parts and add a stronger spring. I want to keep this as my CQB M4 of choice, but it just needs a little bit more punch. If you stick to close quarters games, then this should do you some good. So I'll give the BAD a 6 out of 10. For everyday play, it's easy for me to say that since it's an M4 with basic controls and great magazine compatibility, that it scores high marks. However, the range limitations keep me from saying that this is a good choice for field play. The MOSFET and ECU open you up to more controls and any beginner can just pick this thing up and go. Battery space is limiting and the underside of the handguard is pretty much useless on the SBR, but overall, I think a six out of 10 is fair. For collector value, well, it's purely dependent on if you think Battle Arms development is a brand worth collecting. But if that's so, then I'd say hunt down the gas blowback model. Simply said, no one will be running over to you to ask about your stock RWA BAD. Because to a lot of people, it's just another tactical M4. So what would you expect more than a 4 out of 10? Build quality brings the score back up though, as the all aluminum build quality is sturdy. Nothing wobbles to a point of being annoying, and it feels like a really high-end AEG. Even in its stock form, the rifle does look stylish if you know what you're looking at. You could dock that it's not fully ambidextrous, and the lack of any real M-lock space under the handguard though, but I feel confident with a 7 out of 10. It is tough, 
but I feel like an LCT, an ENL, or some VFCs are tougher. Then for worthiness, I focused on what this M4 is trying to be good at. Both variants look good in base form, and it definitely performs well, keeping in mind that it's obviously meant for CQB. Even with that low power range, it was impressive for what it's supposed to be doing. And the electronics inside are always great. The Gate Aster is also well loved in the community for a lot of reasons, but that being said, I can't think of many reasons to praise the Quick Change Fortis handguard. I just think it's a bit of a gimmick. These go from anywhere from $450 to $500 unless a premium is tacked onto it. And since VFC Avalons hover in at around the same price point with less going on inside, I'd have to agree with the price point. I know the price is where it is because of some licensing issues, but all things considered, I give the RWA Battle Arms development a worthiness rating of 8 out of 10. It's good, but not mind-blowingly astonishing. Overall, the stock BADs can seem like just another M4 in the ocean, but the Aster saves it just a bit. I am really happy to have a really good looking solid M4 for CQB with a one of a kind UV reactive paint job. But if we're going to be as fair as possible, then I'll have to stick with my scores of 31 out of 50. But that would be everything I have to say about the RWA BAD SBR AEG. But let me know in the comments down below if you liked it or not. And please go watch all the other videos that you can find over this piece if you're really interested in it. Red Wolf made a video of course, and so did my colleagues at EVIC, and so did No No Cat. Remember to do your own research. Now, of course, I have more videos coming up, more reviews, more countdowns, and some special videos coming from a Toronto trip that we just took. Again, I want to thank everyone from Red Wolf Airsoft for sending me this example that was Cerakoted just for me. And I want to thank Extreme Airsoft in Rhode Island for just being an amazing airsoft arena in general. Links to the RWA BAD and to Extreme Airsoft's websites will be listed in the description as well as a link to our greatest supporter, evic.com. Be sure to use our exclusive evic.com link to directly support the U.S. Airsoft channel. But until that next video drops from the city of San Antonio, this has been Scott Hollenbeck, and I will be sure to see you all next time. I'm going to go have a little bit of fun with this UV flashlight now. trigger is actually really snappy, which of course you'd want in CQB environments. Binary is such a treat. I love having that capability in any of my AEGs. And now my battery is dead.